All right. Well, I think I'll start now. I'm a minute late, so uh, I'm just going to welcome you all to um, this first sort of parallel session from the Global Water Futures Annual Science Meeting here on the vulnerability and resilience of uh, northern ecosystems to change. So I'm Sean Carey from McMaster University. And uh, on behalf of myself and Jen Balzer from Wilfrid Laurie, we'd like to thank you. It's uh, a couple of sort of things that I want to talk about. The first is that it's important to recognize that, you know, we have people here in this session from across Canada on a, a sort of a great deal of a great diversity of, of different sort of indigenous lands. I'm at McMaster University and McMaster University is uh, on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations. Um, it's subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. It's, a, it's a, about a 300 year old agreement that was, that was actually signed in Montreal to share resources in and around the Great Lakes between uh, the Iroquois Confederacy and the Ojibwe nations, allied nations at the time. So it's uh, something that's still in place. Uh, and uh, GWF has put a lot of time and effort into sort of looking at the way we interact with Indigenous folks and how water can bring us all together. And I think at the beginning of this uh, session, especially with work in the North, that we all just take time to acknowledge uh, where we are and sort of the special relationship uh, that Indigenous peoples have with the environment and what they've left us and uh, to help steward and, and how important it is for us to sort of uh, bring that forward and acknowledge it in our research. Uh, the other thing I'd like to mention is that there's a GWF code of conduct, which uh, requires us to behave ourselves. So uh, you had to click the read, uh, you read it. So uh, basically it's uh, just for us to be civil and to have a kind of collegial discourse and uh, amongst ourselves. So at this point, I think I'd like to pass it over to uh, Jen and she's gonna introduce our first speaker, Steve Pickell, who joins us from the NWT. So, so Jen, I don't know how this works. So hopefully you pop on here and say something and I'll pop off. Okay. All right, perfect. Um, hi everyone, and and welcome to this session. We're really excited about the session today, and to have we have a great lineup of speakers. Uh, the first of the first of whom is is Dr. Steve Coquel. Uh, Steve is a permafrost scientist with the uh, Northwest Territories Geologic Survey, and a leading expert on permafrost in Canada. His research focuses on permafrost and terrain stability in the Northwest Territories. Um, he's also interested in the influence of permafrost on infrastructure stability and making geoscience information accessible to the public. Most recently, Dr. Pukel has spearheaded an important initiative, the NWT Thermocarst Collective, to advance our understanding of the spatial patterns of abrupt thaw processes. So I'll, at, at that, I'll, I'll leave it to you, Steve, and, and thank you for providing your insights on permafrost landscapes and critical linkages to hydrologic function to, to kick off this session. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Jen. Uh, so yeah, that was a nice introduction. Um, Steve Coquel, I'm the head of the Permafrost Science Group here at the Northwest Territories Geological Survey. I'm talking to you from Yellowknife, which is on the shores of Great Slave Lake in Chief Drybees Territory. It's the traditional home of the Yellowknife's Dene and also home to the uh, North Slave Métis. So uh, yeah, over the next 15 minutes, I'm gonna uh, talk about the diversity and dynamics of permafrost thaw. And I think I just want to sort of impart this idea that, that permafrost is the glue that holds northern landscapes together. It's, uh, it's defined by climate. Uh, it provides a foundation for our ecosystems. It influences the way water runs off the land, but it also provides the foundation for our communities and our infrastructure. So it's become central and very personal to, for northerners. Uh, but it is also a central uh, part or a central discipline associated with understanding Arctic environmental change. So I, I'm going to cover two main topics in my talk today. The first is, is just a little bit of a general background about permafrost, but I'd like you to think about what I have to say in the context of this idea that the present state and the future fate of permafrost is a consequence of what happened in the past. Now that's a very geological concept. It's a very geographical concept. And I think if we think about permafrost and permafrost change that way, it's gonna really help frame what makes sense going forward in terms of understanding spatial distribution and trajectories of change. And then the second part of the talk, I'll talk a little bit about the project that Jen, Jennifer uh, mentioned, which is the Thermocarst Mapping Collective, which uh, addresses some of the uh, I guess the information gaps with respect to our current understanding of the diversity and distribution of permafrost thought. I'll try to advance my slide. 
What is permafrost? It's simply materials, materials that remain frozen for at least two years. Most of us are familiar with this permafrost map of Canada. Permafrost does extend into Alaska, but this is a very Canada-centric map that our colleagues at Geological Survey produced. Uh, the distribution of permafrost uh, as we go north uh, is it, it underlies almost all of the landscape where the climate is cold. As we go further south, the proportion of the terrain affected by permafrost decreases. That's simply what this map portrays. However, the thickness of permafrost also varies. If we know the ground surface temperature, the thermal properties of the earth materials and the geothermal gradient, we can estimate at equilibrium the thickness of permafrost. Where the climate is cold, uh, where the landscape is old, permafrost in the Arctic can exceed 400 meters in thickness. In unglaciated terrain, permafrost can even be a kilometer in thickness. However, as we move south, permafrost gets thin and it gets patchy. Permafrost is defined by temperature. And for those of us that study permafrost, this is called a trumpet curve and, and we're, we're quite familiar with it. It characterizes the thermal regime with depth at a given location. And it represents the maximum and minimum temperatures through the depth profile. Uh, some elements that I'd point out here is the amplitude of annual variation decreases with depth to a point of zero amplitude. And then if we follow the gradient with depth, which is the vertical axis, we get to the base of permafrost where temperatures are above zero. The area in the near surface that thaws and refreezes each year is referred to as the active layer, and its thickness is, it varies depending on climate, but also thermal properties of the earth materials. It's important to point out there's some peculiarities about uh, near surface permafrost temperatures, and you may see in the center of this figure the thermal offset. And that's the difference between the mean annual temperature at the ground surface and at the top of permafrost, and those can deviate depending largely on the seasonal variation in the thermal properties of earth materials. Now, to, to really kind of unpack what that means and, in, and of relevance particularly to, to the ecological community is if we have something like organic deposits where the seasonal thermal properties vary, uh, peat is a great example. It's a great insulator, has a low thermal conductivity in summer. When it freezes and is saturated, it becomes a good thermal conductor and it can promote ground cooling in the winter time. So as a result in peatlands, we can have temperatures at the ground surface that are above zero, but we can sustain permafrost at depth, provided we don't have terrain disturbance or things like fire, which we know are important. So thinking about this relationship between air temperature and permafrost temperature, I've drawn some data from a colleague of mine, Sharon Smith, uh, with the Geological Survey of Canada, and it portrays the air temperatures from the Alberta border to the Beaufort Sea coast, and those are drawn in blue. And we can see, of course, air temperatures decrease as we go northward. And ground temperatures uh, also follow the same trend, but they are several degrees warmer. However, we'll notice that the variation about the regression lines is significantly greater for the ground surface temperatures. And this relates to the presence of the buffer layer, which is the layer of snow and vegetation, which, uh, which affects the exchange of energy between the atmosphere and the ground surface. So the take home message here is that although air temperatures may not vary significantly over a local scale, permafrost temperatures may vary significantly depending on all these other things like vegetation, uh, terrain conditions, and soil properties. So permafrost can exist in all sorts of materials ranging from bedrock. We can have around Yellowknife, there can be permafrost in the bedrock. And of course, if that permafrost thaws, it has very little consequence to the terrain. However, if permafrost thaws in areas underlain by ice-rich material, the landscape can change significantly depending on how much ground ice there is that is hosted in that permafrost. In the Yellowknife area, a lot of the ice-rich permafrost that exists locally owes to the legacy of proglacial Lake McConnell, which was a large lake uh, of which Great Bear Lake and Great Slave Lake and Lake Athabasca are now sort of the remaining puddles. And as that lake atrophied, it it, uh, it left fine-grained sediments into which permafrost degraded. And at that time, because of the way that water behaves in freezing and frozen soils, ice lenses grow and the permafrost becomes ice rich when it first forms. 
Another type of ground ice that owes its legacy, it's, that owes its existence to uh, geological legacy is that of massive ice. Uh, we have a lot of areas in Northwestern Canada where there is ground ice left over from the last glaciation. This, the thaw of this ice, of course, has tremendous consequences in terms of landscape change. And then this is kind of an organic concept. Permafrost can grow and it can grow ice over time. Uh, Ice Wedge Network is a classic example where thermal contraction, cracking of the ground in winter causes a vein, a, a crack to form, snow melt water infiltrates, causing a vein to grow, and over time, repeated cracking can cause a, light, a large ice wedge to form. So this idea that if the ground stays cold over time, it can change and it can change its properties, it can change what's inside is, is actually really cool geologically. So we're gonna take this now and think about how we can wrap these things together to uh, understand why certain landscapes are changing the way that they are. These are two photographs of uh, terrain in the high Arctic on Banks Island from the 60s and in 2005. And we can see a dramatic transformation as a result of top down thaw. So active layer deepening or an increase in active layer thickness uh, and the thawing of ice wedges in the near surface permafrost. This is occurring despite the fact that the permafrost on Banks Island is about minus 10. So that the mean annual permafrost temperature is very cool. In this environment, the active layer, there's no organic buffer so that the, the thermal regime in the, in the soil is actually very tightly connected to what's happening in the atmosphere. And as the air temperatures warm in the summer, the active layer increases in thickness. In this environment, the permafrost on Banks Island has accumulated a lot of ice over time. And hence, it is very sensitive to change, even though the terrain is very cold. So now we take this to understanding terrain sensitivity to landsliding. And in the map, in the central part of the figure, uh, we see the distribution of large landslides across Northwestern Canada. And we were able to do, pull this data together because it's only recently since we've had remote sensing coverage of equal quality over large spatial scales. And what we did here was um, we, we uh, exhibit uh, or express the, the uh, distribution of, of thaw slumps. We can see there's a lot of hot spots in Northwestern Canada, but there's a lot of places that aren't affected by disturbance such as this. The uh, blue lines, which are kind of like spaghetti all over the, uh, the map, express the maximum extent of the Laurentide glaciation. And we can see that that bounds the Western extent of the distribution of these types of features. And some of the other lines uh, really nicely connect the uh, hot spots on the terrain. And this tells us that there's a lot of leftover ground ice from the glaciation preserved in permafrost in Northwestern Canada. So the processes that transformed landscapes in the South have not yet occurred in Northern Canada because permafrost stabilized landscapes. Now the climate is warming, we're seeing dramatic transformation. And that's illustrated in some of these photographs. What I'd like to point out though, is the diversity of the types of failures that are expressed in this photo. So to an ecologist, me saying that the boreal forest is just full of trees, um, maybe there's evergreen trees and deciduous trees, but that's about it, would kind of be like somebody saying, well, these are landslides, they're all the same. They're actually quite different. In the top left corner, we have retrogressive thaw slumps, which are forming gradually through time um, because of the thawing of relic uh, massive ice. In the uh, top right, we have shallow landslides, which occur really abruptly, often in relation to warm summer temperatures or precipitation events. And then in the bottom right corner, we are now starting to see these massive deep seated failures where permafrost is failing at its base. Like, so the entire layer of permafrost, 20 or 30 meters thick, is being translocated laterally into river valleys. And then um, we have the uh, bedrock failures, which are now also becoming more common in the other corner. Uh, this extends and this diversity also extends to variation in the uh, degradation of other landforms such as peatlands. So we have these broad scale depictions of what's going to happen to Arctic environments in association with climate warming. And here is a model depiction of the changes in permafrost zonation, but it tells us very little about how the landscape is actually going to change. Some other GIS-based modeling products also attempt to, uh, to illustrate this, but again, they, they, they do little for us in terms of helping us assist uh, to understand how different environments, different communities across the North are gonna be affected by change. 
And that's really what prompted the NWT Thermocarst Collective, which is a Northern-based collaborative um, that uh, involves academics, namely Wilfrid Laurier University, as well as our uh, government partners, uh, to develop empirically-based maps of permafrost geohazards and thaw-sensitive terrain. The map takes a grid-based approach and uh, it involves the development of rubrics uh, to train uh, that mappers can use. Uh, and so these mappers become trained to identify geomorphic features and they classify whether or not particular landforms are present or absent in uh, a particular grid cell. And so it's actually, it's, it's not high tech, uh, but it requires uh, students and uh, young people interested in permafrost and, and myself as well, um, to learn a lot about the different landforms that are affecting permafrost terrain. And then with the assistance of a geodatabase um, using an ARC platform to be able to map the distribution of these disturbances or these different landforms across northern landscapes. So I'm just going to zoom into Banks Island and just show you some preliminary results from Banks Island. So this took our mapper Mike Pope from Queens about uh, a week to finish. Uh, so Banks Island is about 70,000 square kilometers and it depicts the distribution of thaw slums on the island. And then that's compared here to a monumental effort by Lefkovich and Way, who mapped every disturbance on Banks Island. And this took them over a year to do. And we rasterized that data to show that it really the pattern that emerges is that very similar between these two products, although ours is a nice rapid assessment. Now we we're able to map larger areas. So we show the results of the landscapes affected by thawing slopes in the central part of this figure. And then we compare it to some of the GIS based modeling products that are actually well used um, and depict patterns across circumpolar scales. So for myself as a territorial geological um, survey lead, uh, somebody who's accountable to Northern communities, and understands the gaps in terms of our knowledge of landscape change, it does make me feel that our empirically based map, which is in the central part of this figure, does contribute new knowledge to understanding the distribution of sensitive terrain across the north. So the last example I'm gonna talk about is the, the map, the, 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 the project provides us with a broad based perspective on landscape change, but there's also depth to the assessments because we assess a number of different features that are that are that occur under these themes that depict landscape change. And I'll just focus on the hydrological theme. One of the challenges that communities have and resource managers in the north is understanding what does permafrost thaw mean. And so what I'm going to do here is just show you this next slide, which is a, a preliminary result showing a community synthesis. So these are 5,000 square kilometer areas around communities in extensive discontinuous permafrost and continuous permafrost, highlighting how different the, the features and the processes under the hydrological theme are that are affecting landscapes across uh, and affecting different communities in the, in the Northwest Territories. In the far north, the degradation of ice wedge polygons, pond expansion and thaw slumping is affecting environments around communities, whereas that transitions to a different suite of processes in our communities in the Taiga Plain and the Taiga Shield areas. So again, permafrost thaw means very different things in different places. That's the take home message here. So to wrap up, I just wanna leave you with these following ideas. Permafrost conditions are inherited from the past. It's a geological thing. Um, the nature of permafrost thaw is highly variable through space and time. So depicting that and understanding the patterns of variation are really important because they dictate the environmental and societal consequences of permafrost thaw. Surface expression of permafrost terrain provides insight into future trajectories of change and it can be mapped. And so we can do this with AI, we can do this through remote sensing, but I'd still like HQP and, and people interested in permafrost to have kind of a ground-based understanding of what change is. And then a gap, and obviously no time to talk about this in this, pre in this presentation, but it's really important that we think about how to link terrestrial effects of thawing permafrost to aquatic systems. And that remains a significant gap in our understanding of Arctic change. So thank you. And I just leave you with this figure and a paper that's coming out that addresses the last point. Um, so if you're interested, um, yeah, please look that up. Thanks again. And I'm gonna pass it on to my colleague, Isla. 
All right, thanks, Steve. I uh, really appreciate that. I'm not sure, you know, it, we have some time at the end whether we want to, you know, maybe after after Isla gives her presentation, we'll stop for a little bit for questions for the for the two um, opening speakers. Uh, Jen, I think does that sound good for you? I don't know if you're on, but we could probably slide along now. Yep, sounds great. Okay. Uh, hello again, everyone, and thanks, Steve, for a great um, a great overview of, of of these issues with permafrost and 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 thaw that's occurring across the north. I might ask you to stop sharing your screen if that's okay, and then I think Isla can probably share her screen. Awesome. Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. My Isla Myers Smith. Dr. Dr. Myers Smith is a Chancellor's Fellow and Senior Lecturer in the School of Geosciences at the University of Edinburgh. She's the recipient of many awards, in, including um, being one of National Geographic Society's explorers. Um, Isla leads the Global Change Research Group known by many around the world as Team Shrub, a dynamic team that focuses on how global change alters plant communities and ecosystem processes, including a major focus on tundra ecosystems, which I will be hearing about a bit today. Anyway, thank you, Isla, for joining us, and I'll pass it over to you. Great, thank you very much, and hopefully you can see my slides and everything's looking good. Um, so. For the talk today, I was anticipating what Steve was going to talk about, and I wanted to focus on the ideas of water and future in tundra and really thinking about the frozen water component and, and how that might influence vegetation change that we see in these systems. And my research group is called Team Shrub, and that's because we love to think about vegetation change broadly, but also specifically the increase in shrubs in these systems. And, and one of the big questions that I have is how much of that um, vegetation change, and in particular, the increase in shrubs, is due to indirect versus direct um, drivers of change from warming. So are we seeing more shrubs in these tundra landscapes because the air temperatures are warming, or is it that we are seeing these other changes in the system, such as changes to the permafrost that are leading to the vegetation change that we see. So that's a question that I'm gonna pose through this talk. And I wanted to start by acknowledging the team. So the work that I am presenting for you today is, is not just the work of myself, the work of, of many of the early career researchers who have worked with me. And I also wanna mention from the get-go that this is very much collaborative research. So we work at different scales and our focal research site is on the Yukon North Slope on Kikiktark, Herschel Island. And the work that we do there is in collaboration with Yukon Parks and the Inabalawit people. So these are two of the park rangers and we're sort of crouched above a transect where um, the park rangers are monitoring the, the plant phenology, the timing of when plants grow throughout the summer. And we collaborate together on collecting the ecological monitoring data and interpreting those data. And uh, a lot of what I'm presenting to you today is more at the circumarctic scale, but um, it's the collaborative efforts of many research teams working with local people. And so I wanted to start with the climate warming and think of it from a circumpolar perspective. And in the talk today, I am going to focus mostly on the tundra biome. But much of what I say applies to the boreal forest as well and, and to the research of people who are here in this talk. So much of the high latitudes are warming and it, it's relatively even. So there's warming happening everywhere. And that warming could be directly influencing the trajectories of vegetation change that we see in tundra ecosystems. And so this is one of the species that at least at, at our research site seems to be doing really well as things warm. It's not a shrub, it's um, Areophrum vaginatum, a sedge species. And on Kikik Dark and also at other sites in the Western Canadian Arctic, uh, we see more of this area from species over time. And if we sort of scale up now to what a satellite sees of the Earth, uh, there's this prominent greening pattern that's seen across different satellite data sets. And so this is the, the GIMS data set, the AVHRR data, um, really large pixel sizes, uh, eight kilometers or so, um, but it gives this impression of, of greening across the tundra region and also in parts of the boreal forest with also very prominent browning often occurring where forest fires have happened. And then let's link to what Steve was talking about, permafrost thaw and the fact that all of these high latitude environments are very much um, influenced by what is below the ground surface and, and how much ice there is um, in underneath these systems. And so this is taking you to Kikik Tarek and one of the retrogressive thaw slumps there. And you can see how the tundra ecosystem 
the above ground part is, is just this thin green layer sitting above the active layer, which is about uh, probably 40 centimeters deep in this shot. Uh, and then beneath that at this site is a lot of ice. And so just to review, we've got the continuous permafrost, the discontinuous permafrost, and the sporadic. And, and for a lot of the tundra biome, we're talking about pretty continuous um, permafrost cover. Um, but it's perhaps the ice within that permafrost that matters for thinking about the vegetation change that we're going to see on the surface there. And so the region in which uh, Team Shrub does a lot of our field research is in this very ice rich part of the tundra biome. And something that many of you I'm sure are quite familiar with is that the high latitudes store substantial amounts of carbon. And if you look across, so on the um, right side here, we have a diagram of latitude on the y-axis and carbon stocks on the x-axis. And you can see that big below ground uh, carbon pool at high latitudes. And then in contrast, uh, above ground, the higher carbon pool in the above ground component of ecosystems is more towards the equator. And even as you move across the treed to um, tundra ecotone in high latitudes, you can see a transition again from more carbon being in the below ground environment than the above ground, depending on what tree line we're talking about. But this idea that a lot of the carbon is below ground and in those permafrost soils is really critical for thinking about the implications of vegetation change. So again, we can sort of map out where um, the, the carbon is within these tundra landscapes and, and what influence that might have. And so you can start to sort of layer up these ideas where the ice is, where the carbon is. And that can allow you to calculate what part of the tundra biome might be most vulnerable to thaw of permafrost. And this, is, this map is more from the carbon perspective, but it's also, uh, you can look at it through a vegetation change lens. And so I just wanted to show you a bit about the kind of vegetation change that we see up on Kikitar. So these are repeat photographs um, from uh, when I first arrived at the site uh, and, and initially from the beginning of the ecological monitoring program. And over time, you can see shrubs taking over this um, floodplain landscape on Kikitar. And so the last time we visited the site was in 2019. And now this uh, valley, it's pretty dominated by one shrub in particular, this is Salix Richardsonia. So is that vegetation change that we're seeing uh, in specific sites around the tundra biome relating to that greening that we're seeing from space? If we look at the ecological monitoring programs that we have across the tundra biome as a whole, and this is particularly uh, presenting the international tundra experiment um, data, we see uh, across the tundra biome a decrease in the bare ground in tundra ecosystems, an increase in the shrub species, and also an increase in graminoids, and more mixed responses for the other functional groups. And that really parallels the kind of change that we're seeing on Kikiktark, but it's happening around the circumpolar Arctic. And that shrubification that I showed you in the video there, again, is something that we're seeing at many sites around the Arctic. So this is a literature review that I started back during my PhD, and we published an um, updated version last year in Global Ecology and Biogeography. And it's reporting all the studies in the literature that indicate increases in shrubs. And it comes from a variety of different sources of information. So ecological monitoring, historical ecology, dendroecology, and rote sensing. And most of those studies um, are suggesting an increase in shrub cover. But of course, there could be a bit of publication bias there. But it does parallel the findings we're seeing in the ecological monitoring as well. And then if we look at those shrubs um, and the growth of those shrubs, we find that, that it's climate sensitive. So it's most related to summer temperatures, but there are other factors that seem to be important, including soil moisture, snow melt, sea ice melt in the adjacent um, coastal ecosystems and um, herbivory of different organisms. And so taking that information together, and I didn't have time in this talk to go into great detail, but there is definitely evidence for climate warming directly influencing the growth of plants and that leading to compositional change. But one of the things I want you to think about in this talk is the more indirect mechanisms. And this is a photograph from JJ Frost. And I think the photo is from Siberia, but he's based in Alaska, in Fairbanks. And, and this very cool story that 
he helped to put together about um, how alder shrub recruitment is very related to frost boils in certain parts of the Arctic. And in other parts of the Arctic, various different permafrost disturbances are changing that soil surface and allowing shrub species to recruit. So you get these interactions between the permafrost dynamics and the vegetation change that's occurring. And so I would sort of postulate that what we're seeing here is that there's these direct mechanisms of change via climate warming, but there are indirect mechanisms through things like permafrost thaw, um, through changes in soil moisture, through changes in nutrients that are also influencing vegetation communities. And it could be, at least in the sort of ice rich and very permafrost dynamic parts of the tundra biome, that those mechanisms are more important than the direct influences of air temperature increases. So now in the next section of this talk, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about um, Arctic greening trajectories and thinking about that satellite perspective and what it might mean in terms of change on the ground. So again, this is a picture of Kiki Tark from the air, from a drone. And across this site, if we were to sort of see it from the satellite perspective, there would be pixels and inside those pixels, there would be different mechanisms of change going on. So you might detect uh, browning or no change where there's these uh, steep erosional slopes. You might see greening where there's a more continuous cover of vegetation. There's a retrogressive thaw slump in the background there that might show a browning trend. There's a lot of landscape level complexity um, that's within the pixels of the longer term satellite data sets. You can also spot the muskox herd in the middle there. And so we look across different satellite data sets for the Arctic as a whole, um, from the larger um, pixel sizes like the um, GIMS data set, through MODIS data, through Landsat. Um, we see that Arctic greening across all of those, those different data sets. But if you sort of zoom in uh, to a, a given region like the Western Arctic, the patterns of where things are green versus not don't exactly line up. And so that begs the question, are the satellites are these different satellite platforms really perceiving vegetation change on the ground or is there more complexity at play here? And so this um, stimulated us to start a new collaboration called the High Latitude Drone Ecology Network. And the idea was to just get everyone together who's collecting drone data from sites around the tundra biome or the Arctic more broadly to collect using the same data protocols and then pool our data to try and understand what's going on with this Arctic greening. And so if you look across our high latitude drone ecology network sites, um, we have over 70 of them, you have a nice sort of representation of what we see in the Panarctic as a whole. So a lot of sites are showing greening, some very strong greening trends, and, and some are showing browning trends. And the length of the time series, this is with Landsat data, relates to how um, the data quality of Landsat and the availability of data there. So you can see we're picking up more browning trends with shorter time series. And at all of these sites, they're experiencing warming. And I alluded before, the different satellite data um, that are available have very different um, scales of, um, or grain sizes of resolution. So I'm gonna just show you for Kiki Tar Herschel Island what that looks like. So on top here is the GIMS data set um, with those eight kilometer pixels approximately. And you can see that for Kiki Tar, you can't even get a full pixel on the island. So it's not very useful for understanding change going on at this site. Then we can go down to the MODA scale and now you can start to pick up sort of variation, but, but really these 500 by 500 meter pixels or 250 by 250 meter pixels, um, there's still a lot of change going on within those pixels that we can't detect. And then you can flip over to a Landsat based analysis. And this is just a coarse um, visualization. So ignore all the artifacts there, but you can now start to see landscape level variability in the greening trends over time. So where it's green, that's the increase in um, NDVI and where it's white, no change. And, and the little speckles of brown, that's where NDVI is decreasing at this site. And then I wanted to um, show you here um, what the drone data look like, but to go into high resolution, I'm just gonna focus on one plot for now. So this is QHI for the plot, which is on that floodplain where I showed you the uh, shrub change over time from the repeat photographs. And, and this is the plot on the left and on the right would be the, the Landsat time series if we just fit a linear line through that. So it, this plot is showing green. 
But if we look at the raw Landsat data that's available or the um, cloud corrected Landsat data, you can see that that uh, flat line probably doesn't, or that trend line doesn't really represent uh, the type of change that's going on here. So we have some complex uh, dynamics of change with the Landsat data, which could be related to real ecological things going on, or it could be related to cloud cover gaps, uh, sensor issues, many, many things. And so let's zoom in on that plot again. This is the RGB of that plot. And now let's uh, look at the NDVI of that plot from a drone perspective. So just static for one point in time. And then we can plot the Landsat trends on a pixel by pixel basis on top of this plot as well. So each of these squares is an individual time series of one Landsat pixel. And if it's greening, it, the color is blue, just because there was green going on already here. Uh, and the size of the square is the, the slope of that line. So um, bigger squares, uh, steeper slopes. And if it's browning, then uh, the color is that orange color there. And now we can overplot these two and start to look at spatially what's explaining why in this plot we see a lot of greening, but also a region of quite strong browning and a region of no change. And so what we think is going on at this one site is that that area where, which has experienced browning since the late to mid uh, 2020s is um, due to a change in hydrology in this floodplain. So here's the water coming back in. Uh, the water movement shifted within the floodplain and that's allowed for more greening to occur, more shrubification in parts of the floodplain, and then the ecosystems are drying and becoming more grassy uh, in the other part of the floodplain. And we can do this kind of uh, sort of visualization of change across multiple Hilden sites. So here's a site from Siberia, and, and this has a landslide, though I show a picture of a retrogressive thaw slump, Steve, so don't worry. This one really was a landslide, but I didn't have a beautiful picture of a landslide to show. Um, and you can see here that part of the uh, plot where the landslide has occurred, we actually get a greening trend, but it initially was a very strong browning followed by a vegetation recovery. And now uh, the vegetation inside the disturbance is more green than the starting point. And then we can flip over to a plot that's on the Tuck Highway and you can see when the road was built very clearly in the Landsat data. And then you can look at some of the other factors that are within inherent within the greening analyses that we conduct at the Panarctic scale, but are often missed, which are things like small ponds and, and water artifacts. Um, and they come out very clearly when you start to spatially map things at that um, Landsat scale, but they wouldn't be detectable in say a MODIS analysis. And so if we look across all of our Hilden sites, which again, do a pretty good job of representing the variation that we see in the tundra biome as a whole, um, we have this sort of pattern of um, many sites undergoing greening, but not all of that greening is particularly linear. Um, we have uh, a good chunk of the sites around 15% showing some sort of browning, but most of that browning is nonlinear as well. And then there's about 42% of the Hilden network, which reflects well what's going on at the at tundra biome scale as well, where there's statistically no trend in this NDVI. But the question is, are there ecological signals within that no trend that tell us about how um, vegetation change might be progressing on the landscape? And how much of or how many of these trends are due to artifact versus real world ecological signal? So that's where the challenge lies. And once we figure all of that out, we can go back to these um, satellite greening maps and detect what is the real world ecological change and what is artifact and, and what are the trajectories of those change. And so I want to bring back that idea of vulnerability and the sort of hypothesis that I'll pose to you today is that the areas where um, permafrost thaw and, and carbon losses um, could be progressing at a more rapid rate are also where um, vegetation greening could occur at a more rapid rate, but probably in a nonlinear fashion. And so by sort of superimposing that vulnerability of thaw and the greening, that's where we might um, suggests that the, the, the greatest um, future change might be occurring. And we just know from looking at the photographs in Steve's talk and, and, and our own experiences in these systems that, that permafrost is dictating the vegetation trajectories that we see and, and water, um, liquid water and frozen water um, determine what happens on the surface. And I just wanna make the point here towards the end of the talk that up to 80% of tundra biomass is below ground. And with our satellites and our drones, we're only getting a 
sort of above ground perspective on the change that's going on. So the additional challenge is to really figure out how what we see above ground is really um, leading to change in the vegetation below ground. And so I sketched these little diagrams um, this week as I was putting the talk together. And so my sort of question about the sites that I work at and the tundra biome as a whole is what are these trajectories of future vegetation change? Can we detect them from satellite remote sensing data? Or do we need on the ground data to really understand as we transition from current vegetation with permafrost thaw, is that bringing us increased biomass, loss of bare ground, warmer loving plant species? Is there greater biomass uh, accumulating below ground? Um, in places where the permafrost thaw is leading to ponding, are we seeing more aquatic plant communities? Will that um, suddenly drain and bring us back to a drier um, tundra ecological trajectory? So those are some of the questions that I'm really keen to get at in the coming years. And I think uh, that the group here and, and all the research that's going on will also provide great insight for the Arctic and the boreal. And of course, why does this matter? Because ultimately, all of Arctic food webs depend on those vegetation trajectories from pollinators to key wildlife species like caribou. So I'll sort of end with this idea that Arctic greening is perhaps not the simple story that's been told in the literature so far. The simple story being climate warming equals vegetation change equals greening detected from satellites but this much more complex picture in which water and permafrost thaw probably play a really critical role. And those indirect drivers could be just as important or more important in certain locations as the direct drivers. And ultimately it matters for Arctic people. And so that brings us back to sort of the importance of, of collaborating with uh, local people and uh, listening to the knowledge that they have had about these systems and for local people, freeze-thaw dynamics have always been at the forefront of their understanding of how these ecosystems play out. And perhaps as a scientific community, we haven't totally taken that on board, at least on the vegetation side of things. So I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. All right. Uh, thanks so much, Isla, for that presentation. It was wonderful, with beautiful graphics and images. And, uh, and I love all the matching sweaters there. That's super nice too. I don't know how you got that done. That's pretty neat. And uh, we're a little uh, kind of short on time. So I think we'll just try to probably have uh, questions at the end when all the speakers have given the presentation, if that's okay. And I don't know, Catherine, are you ready to go? I noticed this is sort of a Game of Thrones reference here, fire and ice, shifts in boreal ecosystem structure. <laughs> Catherine is a, a postdoc at uh, the University of Guelph at the moment. I know Catherine from her PhD time at Western and hanging out in the lab a little bit. So, uh, but I'm excited for your talk here, Catherine. And as we sort of talk about fire and another big aspect of uh, vulnerability for Northern ecosystems. So take it away. Awesome. Thanks, John. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone. And uh, so I'm excited to be here today thinking about boreal ecosystems and in particular thinking about the effects of both wildfire and permafrost on these systems and how they can impact key ecosystem structures as well as what the cascading implications can be for ecosystem functions, particularly carbon, which is near and dear to my heart. And I hope to convince you guys today that these two disturbances on the landscape are often fundamentally linked within the boreal as they can quite literally share common ground. And so to make my case, I'm first gonna focus on that fire carbon relationship where fire can be both a direct and an indirect driver of carbon dynamics. So fire directly affects carbon through combustion, but fire can also indirectly affect carbon by influencing key aspects of forest structure. And so a classic example of this is the effect of fire on forest stand age. So for example, when a fire is particularly frequent on the landscape, it can cause younger stands to become more prevalent as it consumes many stands before they reach their more intermediate to mature ages. And this has potential consequences for boreal carbon as well. Of course, the conceptual map that I'm presenting here is definitely simplified for the purposes of today's talks, because these relationships can be complex and at times they're also bi-directional. But it's this relationship between fire and carbon that our research team has been really interested in quantifying. And one way we've been doing this is through this multi-regional analysis of carbon stocks and combustion rates using a novel data set with over 340 plots that span three geographic locations, namely Alaska, the Northwest Territories, and Saskatchewan. 
with the goal of contrasting the high frequency fire regimes of the southern boreal with those that we're seeing in our more northern stands. And we're interested in this as the high frequency fire regime of our southern boreal may actually represent a contemporary analog for the future of our more northern stands in terms of stand structure as well as carbon dynamics. And so our first step was to find evidence of this indirect effect of fire on forest structure, particularly in terms of stand age. And so you can see that presented here. And so we've binned our stands across these different regions into three different stand age classes. We have our young stands, which are somewhere between zero to 69 years. Then we have our intermediate stands, which range from 70 to 99 years. And then finally, we have our mature stands, which are 100 years or older. And then you can see those two geographic regions where the southern boreal is in the light green and our northern boreal is in that more gold tone. And you can see that approximately 80% of our northern boreal stands could be classified as either intermediate or mature, while our southern boreal stands had about 70% of them that could be classified as young. And that provides evidence of this fire driven shift in our stand structure on the landscape. But it opens up that question of, well, what does that mean for carbon? And so we looked into that as well. And you can see our results presented here using that same binning structure of the three different geographic areas and those same three stand age classes. Except on the hordes, or sorry, the vertical axis, we have our total pre fire carbon stocks presented. And you can see there are differences in terms of our age classes as well as our geographic regions. But our central question is really about what happens to carbon stocks if northern boreal stands were to develop that predominantly young stand age structure as we currently see in the more southern stands. Well, we found that young stands on average contain somewhere between one to seven kilograms of carbon per meter squared less than their intermediate and mature counterparts on the landscape particularly those that are currently in the north. And this indicates that there is a potential for a loss of carbon storage in our northern stands if we were to have this shift in stand age structure. But I hear the question, what about permafrost? How does this all connect in? Well, quite often when we think about permafrost thaw, we tend to think about this in terms of that more gradual top down thaw and the implications for boreal carbon dynamics which is a very important relationship to understand. But fire can also trigger rapid permafrost thaw by consuming the surface organics that insulate permafrost, as Steve was talking about earlier. And as a research team, we've been really interested in quantifying this fire permafrost interaction and understanding its indirect implications for carbon dynamics as well. And one way we've been doing this is by monitoring the seasonal thaw depths at 92 permafrost sites throughout Southern NWT. And so this site network targets sites that were impacted by the 2014 wildfires. And you can see the fire scars here presented in orange, as well as other sites that haven't burned um, sometime, well, the last time they burned was sometime prior to 1965. And we use these as controls across the landscape to contrast these different fire histories. And then throughout this site network, we were also able to extract eight permafrost cores that were then returned to the lab where they could be subsampled and then incubated under standardized conditions to understand post thaw CO2 emission trends across our sites. And in doing so, we've found evidence that yes, there's definitely um, rapid top down thaw that's going on throughout the network. We found our control sites had approximately half a meter of uh, thaw throughout these regions throughout the four years that we were monitoring them. And then on top of that, we found that our fire impacted sites had significantly greater thaw depths than our controls, generally thawing by an additional 3.5 centimeters uh, per year. And so that demonstrates that um, our fire can intensify our permafrost loss on the landscape, even in the context of this relatively rapid top down surface warming as well. And then what we did is we took that data where we uh, had our seasonal thaw, and then we also had in situ permafrost temperature measurements at depth as well as our standardized lab incubation results to try and estimate potential CO2 carbon emissions from our permafrost sites in the field. And I'm not going to go into the details of this process just for the brevity sake of today, 
But through this effort, we found that the potential for CO2 carbon emissions across these different site histories were actually relatively similar, even when we've taken into account the deeper seasonal thaw depths, as well as the warmer soil temperatures at our fire sites. And the reason for this is we found in our laboratory incubations that the surface soils at our control sites were almost twice as productive as our fire sites, suggesting that the lower soil carbon quality found at our fire sites uh, may actually relay a capacity or a component of resilience to subsequent decomposition processes. So this is still preliminary, but it, I think it creates an interesting contrast there. Okay, but fires can do more than uh, what we've discussed so far. They can also trigger these relatively dramatic structural shifts at our permafrost sites. And so that can cause sites that have previously been dominated by black spruce forests to undergo a wetland conversion into thermokarst features like bogs on the landscape. And these shifts can include changes in vegetation as well as local hydrology, as we've already talked about a bit today which can be key determinants of carbon cycling patterns, which are not really well captured in the incubation style studies that I was discussing previously. So instead, to try and capture some of those uh, additional complications or complexities on the landscape, we're exploring this relationship with permafrost thaw and carbon dynamics using a long-term study plot that were established at the Alaskan uh, peatland experiment, which is in central Alaska at Fairbanks. And we're using this particular gradient because it spans a gradient of permafrost thaw, which goes from somewhere closer to stable all the way out to what we're calling this late stage thaw, or what we can think of perhaps a little bit more simplistically as stable and going, going, and pretty much gone. And using this approach, uh, work that was led by Will Cox, who is a PhD student on our team, He's demonstrated that there's actually minimal significant changes in our net ecosystem exchange values across this thaw gradient, but we can see notable changes in our methane fluxes. And so you can see that presented here graphically. We're on the vertical axis. We've got our methane flux at peak productivity, so just in July. And then we have our four thaw stages, so our stable, our early, our intermediate, and then finally our late stages. And they've been monitored across three different years here. And overall, what we found is as we transition from stable to late stage permafrost thaw, when we include the complexities of vegetation and hydrology, we have an 11 fold increase in the rate of methane production, largely due to a concomitant shift in soil moisture in these late stage um, thaw conditions where we have ice rich permafrost. And so stepping back here, we've kind of covered a few concepts. We have went through these ideas of both indirect and direct pathways through which fire and permafrost thaw can influence boreal carbon dynamics, including aspects such as uh, combustion, but particularly shifts in forest structure in terms of stand age, as well as this idea of fire triggered permafrost thaw and subsequent wetland conversion patterns. And in doing so, I think a few points really do become clear. Uh, we see that both direct and indirect pathways of system disturbance are really important and uh, need to be acknowledged in order to quantify both current and future carbon losses, particularly as these pathways can interact. And then finally, I, also, I hope I've also convinced you that boreal fire and permafrost thaw can really fundamentally be linked disturbances on the landscape that need to be considered individually, but also in tandem which is exciting as there's still quite a bit that we don't really have worked out about this relationship. Things like the type of permafrost, uh, the effect of the permafrost thaw state, and perhaps the role of what is actually causing permafrost thaw on the landscape can all be important factors that we can spend some more time together as a field exploring and learning more about. And so with that, I just wanna thank you for your time and I'll wrap it up there. Right. Thanks so much, Catherine. That was just great. And uh, as I say, we're, we're going to leave the questions till the end. I confirmed with the uh, organizers that uh, there's nothing after us. So if we go a little long, it's just for us to be here, which is actually really great. And um, if people want to have questions, they're welcome to put them in the Q&A box uh, so that we can kind of make sure they get asked to the speakers at the end. Um, we're going to sort of transition now from continue to talk about vegetation 
to uh, talking about some more watery stuff. Um, our next speaker is Erin Nichols from McMaster University, and uh, she's going to talk about uh, hydrological implications of the vegetation change in uh, in the Yukon. So uh, whenever you're ready, Erin, I'll leave the floor to you. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, and thanks for having me. Is everyone, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, thanks for organizing this great session. And today I'm going to switch back to um, some vegetation change and discuss the hydrological implications of tree line advance and shrubification um, in a subarctic alpine catchment in Yukon territory. So the work I'm doing was located on the traditional territory of the uh, Fallen Dunn First Nations and the Tahan Gwich'in Council. So the session has uh, summarized some of the cascading hydrological and ecological impacts of vegetation change um, at, at high latitudes and in cold regions. And like I said, I'm going to transition back to talking about this, this big implication of vegetation change. This is happening at different spatial scales, at different temporal rates. Um, but in the areas that we're working, we're really seeing these two main shifts in land classification. So we're seeing this tree line advance and these increases in shrub height, extent, and densities. And the main research question I'm focused on is what are the hydrological implications of these changes? So when we have these increases in vegetation, oops, sorry. Uh, structure um, and changes in vegetation type. We're changing um, the amount of interception that can occur. We're changing that physiological response to transpiration. And so we want to know what are the downstream imp impacts on um, watershed hydrology. And so to look at some of these questions, we've instrumented um, three sites along an elevational gradient that represent this space for time change um, for moving from that boreal forest into um, shrub taiga at a higher elevation. And so these main questions that we want to address are really how does vegetation type and structure influence the timing, magnitude, and partitioning of evaporative fluxes among these sites? And secondly, how will future changes in climate, so increasing temperatures and changing precipitation regimes, affect evaporative magnitude and partitioning? And so those three sites that I mentioned, um, we instrumented in Wolf Creek Research Basin, which is located just south of White Horse in Yukon Territory. And you can see we have a lower elevation white spruce forest, followed by a mid elevation um, kind of our tall dense shrub site that we've called buckbrush, which has willow and birch shrubs that are about one to three meters. And then we have a high elevation site that is about 0.5 meters in height that also has willow and birch shrubs, but also has kind of more exposed ground and more lichen cover as you can see in this top photo here. And at all of these sites, we've instrumented them with eddy covariant systems. Um, the shrub sites have been instrumented since 2015 and the forest site since 2017. And in recent years, we've also installed sap flow sensors. So at the Buckbrush site, we installed um, some Dynamax EcoSkin, ExoSkin sensors on both Willow and Birch. And at the forest, we installed um, grainier style thermal dissipation probes in the white spruce. And just to give you an idea of that thermal gradient and that space for time analogy, um, here you can see the um, mean temperatures at each one of these sites. And the shaded green here represents that growing season length at each of these sites. So we see much longer growing season at forest, and then we're decreasing as we move up in elevation. Um, and the, the tall, dense bark buckbrush site seems to um, begin its growing season a little bit earlier, um, but both of the shrub sites seem to be senescing at the same time. And the way I'll structure the results section of my talk um, is I'm going to first talk about the surface energy partitioning. So how do these different ecosystems function differently as we move from a boreal forest to shrub systems and how do they vary interannually? And then I'll discuss, um, you know, what, how much evaporative losses are we experiencing over these different systems and specifically how much of that evaporative loss is um, attributed to transpiration versus direct evaporation from interception or direct soil evaporation. I also looked at um, what's driving evaporative uh, demand. So what's, um, you know, what's driving ET and transpiration across these sites. And this will help us assess some of that future vulnerability to, to climate change. So is it due to increasing temperatures, um, BPD, or is it more controlled by soil moisture? So we looked at that for, for total ET and then also for transpiration. 
And again, the overarching question here is, what does this mean hydrologically? Um, you know, as we look at the watershed scale, what does this mean for downstream users and for future vulnerability of these systems? And how do we better model this and predict what's going to happen in the future? And so this figure here shows the mean monthly uh, surface energy balance terms. And you can see our sensible heat is in red here and our latent heat is in blue for all the sites. And the main thing to note is that all the sites were dominated by sensible heat early in the season and transitioned to a latent heat dominated system um, later in the season. And that transition happened later um, as we move up in elevation. The other striking uh, Thing I find from this figure is just the lack of interannual variability at the forest. The site is, you know, fairly consistent year to year, whereas we increase that elevation and decreasing um, vegetation cover, we see this large interannual variability in all of the surface energy components. If we take a look at the albedo, our albedo increased with increasing elevation and decreasing vegetation cover um, in, in the summer months. And we also see this kind of striking difference between the uh, midwinter and spring time albedo between the two shrub sites. So if we're thinking about that implication of what does it mean when these shrubs get taller and denser and move in extent, um, we will see sort of th these dramatic differences in these early season available energy. And our shrubs at the sparse uh, shrub site are about, you know, the willows are about 80 centimeters shorter and the birch are about 40 centimeters shorter. Um, and we're still seeing this, this dramatic difference in available energy early in the season. If we think about evaporative losses over the whole growing season, um, we did see the highest ET rates at the forest year to year, and our ET rates are decreasing as we're increasing in elevation. But again, as we decrease that vegetation cover, we're seeing that large increase in interannual variability. Now this figure here is the mean evapotranspiration um, per day uh, for all the study years. So again, there is quite a lot of variability, um, but I did wanna highlight some of these seasonal trends and these striking differences between these ecosystems. Um, the forest, again, we see these higher ET rates at the forest throughout the entire year, but especially in the early season and also in the late season. So we can see that the forest is able to respond to these late season warming more so than the shrubs. And if we are thinking about what are the implications of shrubification, we can also take a look at the fact that our two shrub sites are really similar in terms of their ET rates in, at all periods except this main growing season. And so we also measured our transpiration rates. And when we think about that mid growing season, what's going on between those two sites, we can see that our transpiration rates at our shrubs are really quite high during that peak growing season. So our transpiration rates um, in our white spruce sort of follow the seasonal trend of net radiation. It's fairly gradual. And we see um, that it's you know, beginning earlier on and sustained later in the fall. Whereas when our shrub sites are on, the transpiration rates are actually quite high. And what this means for evaporative, evaporative partitioning um, is really quite interesting. So we had these two years, we studied this in 2019 and 2020. And in 2019, on the left here, um, it was a fairly normal year. It was slightly warmer um, than normal, and it was you know, relatively dry compared to 2020. And our transpiration in both years at the forest comprised about 50% of our total ET. Whereas if we look at our buckbrush site during especially this warm and fairly dry summer, um, our transpiration comprised over 80% of our uh, total ET. So when those plants are on in the middle of the growing season, we can see large evaporative losses. And again, we saw some of the transpiration was suppressed in that, that cool 2020 year. So we also took a look at the evaporative controls. So we used a Penman-Monteith framework to assess these drivers. And we also broke it down by periods of the year to look at these seasonal changes. And the main takeaways I want you to get out of this are just that the net radiation was a primary control of ET at the forest in almost all periods of the year. So we see that gradual seasonal trend that's fairly consistent year to year. Whereas at the sparse shrub site um, and our buckbrush site, we see this really strong surface resistance control in the early green and the senescence period. And you can see on this figure here that we have really high surface resistances at these shrub sites. And these are representative of that early and late green. So the timing of that growing season is really important. Um, but in the middle of the growing season, we are seeing those high transpiration rates once these plants have turned on. 
And finally, we want to take a look at what's actually driving transpiration. And while there's a lot going on here, um, I just wanted to highlight these three main drivers. So in terms of increasing BPD or increasing air temperature at these sites, we saw that the shrubs were a lot more sensitive to these changes than the white spruce. So for every degree of air temperature increase, um, we saw almost double the increase in transpiration at the shrubs than we did at the, um, the white spruce sites. So this has large implications in terms of sensitivity to um, transpiration with a changing climate in the future. And if we look at soil moisture, um, there's main differences between the two sites. You can see on the x-axis, um, our soil water potential, um, our soil suction is you know, a lot lower at our forest site than it is at our shrub site. And as a consequence, we see this relationship where soil moisture is a control of transpiration at our white spruce forest, and not so much of an influence at our shrub site at all. And so what this means is that, you know, we may have more um, moisture vulnerability at the white spruce site than we do at our um, shrub sites that receive more precipitation because they're at higher elevations and they also have these lower evaporations. And on that note, um, what are the hydrological implications of this? And, and what does this mean for both stand level hydrology and kind of watershed implications? And this top row here just shows the cumulative rainfall during the growing season in each year. And this is just cumulative rainfall minus our evaporative demand. And we can see that even in this wet year, so even in the wet 2020 year, we still see that the forest is operating at a water deficit. Um, whereas the sparse shrub and buckbrush remain to be fairly wet um, and they even have a surplus during that wet year. And so what this means is that that forest is heavily relying on snow inputs, whereas most of the uh, growing season water for stream flow is probably generated at these higher elevations where, you know, we have less evaporation um, and we have wetter conditions and less sensitivity to soil moisture. So overall, um, these changes in vegetation are likely to increase in total ET, um, except they, you know, everything's occurring on different uh, temporal and spatial scales. But really, if we see advances in tree line, we'll probably see an increase in um, overall ET throughout the whole growing season. Whereas that those changes in shrub height and density is likely going to play the most important role right in the peak of that growing season. And again, that tree line advance can be slow and susceptible to fire um, and, you know, all these complicated processes that we've been discussing in the session. Um, but we really should keep an eye on how sensitive these systems might be to, to drought in the future and keep that in mind. Whereas the shrub expansion um, may be susceptible to changes in temperature, both in terms of the actual physiological response to transpiration, but also the length of that growing season as well. So, Thank you very much for listening and let me know if you have any questions after the speakers. All right. Thanks so much, Erin. We actually did get that. We know that the Q&A box worked because John Palmer has asked a question you can't answer now, but you can consider it if you can see it. Um, thanks so much. Uh, we'll try to move on uh, to, to the watery world here and uh, bring up Tim Ensign. Tim is from uh, Wilfrid Laurier University. I've known Tim for a long time. He was a master's student back when I was at Carleton. And I remember he rode and took good photos. So I'm looking, looking forward to some good photos, Tim. Hopefully uh, you can turn your camera on and I'll let you go whenever uh, you're ready to go. Well, thanks very much, Sean. And uh, if, um, if you could just tell me at uh, now, if the sound isn't good, I'll make an adjustment here. You sound great, you sound great. Great. Thank you. I have a microphone that's meant to capture my voice, but leave out the background as we have a four month old napping in the next room. And uh, so I really um, want to thank and acknowledge my wife who, who is, is looking after this, uh, this important thing during the talk. But I'll begin by just uh, referring to my first slide here. And um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to present. And uh, as mentioned, I, I live in Yellowknife and I'm working with Steve Coquel of the Northwest Territories Geological Survey and uh, Phil Marsh, my other co-supervisor at Laurier. And uh, the focus uh, that I have for this talk is on, and for my thesis in general, is uh, on temperatures and winter flow in small streams in uh, continuous permafrost in the Western Arctic. The, uh, the photo that we're looking at here is of Hands Creek, about 60 kilometers north of Inuvik, uh, near, near Treeline. And uh, what we see here is a large icing. Or, or body of, of off ice. 
and uh, icings or off ice are important for a number of regions of reasons, uh, one of which uh, uh, is uh, hydrology, but also they're important from the standpoint of ecology and, and human activities. This photo was taken in the early 1980s. Uh, the terms icing and off ice are used interchangeably and both refer to masses of ice formed in layers during winter on top of frozen ground or existing ice and are fed by water from the subsurface. Uh, icing can also refer to the process by which these bodies of ice called off ice are formed and I'll use this naming convention uh, for the most part in this talk. This figure by Wu shows the main water sources that produce off ice in permafrost environments. Shallow groundwater above permafrost, including in the active layer, is called suprapermafrost groundwater. Uh, groundwater conversely below permafrost is called subpermafrost, and we can and this subpermafrost water can move to the surface through talix to feed off ice growth. In areas of thick continuous permafrost, uh, such movement from the deep up towards the shallow environments uh, happens through talix. And um, this is uh, more common in uh, discontinuous permafrost and less common in continuous permafrost. We often classify off ice according to its water source. Ground off ice, which we see on the left, is fed by shallow groundwater. And river off ice, which we see on the right, is often larger and tends to occur in rivers where flow continues during the winter. Off ice occurs at locations where constrictions by ice or channel geometry force the water to the surface. Uh, especially in regions of thick continuous permafrost, the distribution and size of river off ice can tell us about how much water flows in these systems during winter. This video was taken from beneath a bridge about 10 kilometers north of Inuvik on the Inuvik to Taktoyaktak Highway, and it gives us a good illustration of the icing process between October and the following June. Uh, the water here is being sourced from a, about a 16 square kilometer catchment, and the view here is looking upstream from under the bridge. We're now into April and now May, and finally June from 2018. Off ice distribution has been investigated in northwestern Canada, Alaska, and Russia at broad scales. Uh, in the western Arctic, off ice is most common at the base of karstic mountain ranges, including the east side of the Mackenzie Mountains and also the Brooks Range and Alaska Ranges. The faulted and porous carbonate rock of these environments provides continuous conduits for deep groundwater to supply the icing process. In hydrological environments characteristic of the subarctic, in the Great Slave region of the Northwest Territories on the right, uh, off ice are most numerous and largest in regions dominated by limestone and dolomite bedrock, and they tend to recur at the same locations but intermittently, so not every year. Winter water availability is essential for off ice growth. Hydrometric records from many stations in the Western Arctic are suggesting that water, sorry, that winter base flow is increasing in proportion to total annual runoff. Uh, in this, this is evident for large rivers like these here, the Mackenzie and Peel, and also for smaller rivers. Uh, the general causes of increasing winter runoff throughout the Western Arctic are thought to be an increase in the hydrological connectivity of subarctic wetlands as shown by Ryan Conan and other colleagues, as well as a thickening of the active layer, uh, which therefore takes longer to refreeze in the fall. Uh, perhaps the most important uh, contributor to this extended uh, and augmented winter flow though, is a trend towards wetter autumns in parts of the Western Arctic in, uh, in recent years and decades. This trend towards a wetter fall season is shown here uh, quite to, uh, clearly for uh, Baker Creek near Yellowknife. Uh, the, the small blue arrows indicate uh, fall discharge events and the big uh, dark blue arrows are where the fall discharges were actually higher than the spring discharges uh, earlier in the same year. Uh, work by Spence uh, has shown that trends of increasing winter base flow in larger catchments also occur in the Canadian Shield and uh, Kreitz and Conan and others have shown such trends of increasing winter base flow in the northern Cordillera, uh, Mackenzie Valley and lower Liard Valley. Uh, Morris and Wolf have also linked increases in winter base flow here at Baker Creek uh, with increases of local off-ice development. 
small tundra streams in continuous permafrost further north in the Beaufort Delta region uh, don't actually show any winter runoff in their hydrometric records to date. Uh, systems of this size and smaller in the region are the main focus of my current work, and there is potential for climate-induced change in these systems too. A longer period, sorry, a longer period of active layer refreeze and early winter associated with climate warming, and the possible vegetation-driven increases to snow accumulation in riparian environments, which links with what uh, we heard earlier, uh, may promote winter water movement in small tundra streams like these. Current and previous temperature data are showing that regional streams with large catchments tend not to freeze during winter. This figure shows the minimum annual temperature for several stream beds based on records within the past decade, and it suggests that catchments uh, larger than about 100 square kilometers are less likely to have their streams freeze in winter. This may be due to advected heat supplied by lakes in larger catchments, and it suggests a, a greater proportion for winter, sorry, it suggests a greater potential for winter runoff in these streams than was suggested by the previous figure. Uh, the current thesis work is also describing the distribution of off ice along the Inuvik to Taktoyaktak Highway. Uh, the new highway crosses hundreds of small riparian and stream corridors with catchments of varying size and different types of terrain. Thermal disturbances to stream environments by road crossings block winter flow and result in the icing process. Off ice distribution along the highway can therefore indicate which catchments tend to maintain winter runoff for longer. And uh, these conditions or winter water movement would be actually more difficult to observe and monitor without the, the uh, the surface expression that uh, becomes possible when uh, there's a thermal disturbance like a road. These off-ice bodies are tend to be recurrent at these specific locations rather than intermittent as we discussed previously. The relevance of off-ice to northern communities uh, includes the safety and management challenges they create for transportation infrastructure. Off-ice can cover roads in winter and also plug culverts and degrade beneath bridges, uh, which can cause freshet flow to occur at much higher levels than uh, designed for. This can lead to embankment scour and potentially to washout. Off-ice can have other negative effects if they interact with resource development or reclamation projects where contaminants can be mobilized to the environment. This picture so Sorry, this picture shows the Baker Creek icing in spring 2011 when it was so big that it actually diverted Baker Creek during freshet from its channel, which is shown in blue, and risked uh, the inundation of tailings storage sites at, at Giant Mine near Yellowknife. One of the landscape effects of off ice is the potential for it to regulate local ground temperatures. Riparian ground temperature monitoring at paired sites prone and not prone to icings along the ITH is showing how off ice can maintain warmer near surface ground temperatures in riparian systems in their margins during winter and preserve cooler temperatures in early summer than uh, at unaffected sites. Particularly when large, off ice bodies can also regulate water supply in winters during summer. This has advantages for communities and for aquatic and uh, proximal terrestrial habitat during low flow periods. Off ice modifies fluvial geomorphology by changing flow routing during freshet and uh, often promotes braided channels which represent habitat and promote sedimentation and alteration of erosive potential elsewhere on river systems. Uh, and to kind of begin to sum things up here, while winter base flow is likely increasing in hydrological systems, it's difficult to project uh, the integrated effects of climate change on off, uh, on uh, off ice size and distribution. The icing process depends on base flow, but is triggered by thermal conditions driven by air temperature and modified by snow cover. Uh, warmer, sorry, warmer and shorter winters and greater connectivity of flow conduits may lead to conditions that are less less favorable for causing icings despite increased water supply. It's, it's difficult to make projections about icing dynamics. Off ice that occur due to the perturbation of thermal conditions by human activities may be the most likely to persist or even to increase uh, without careful infrastructure design and management practices. Here we have a comparison of the same creek, Trail Valley Creek, uh, 50 kilometers north of Inuvik uh, with uh, deep snow, two and a half meters at the end of one winter and very shallow snow at uh, the end of uh, last winter, just suggesting how this can affect 
um, thermal conductivity in, uh, in the subsurface beneath streams. So to summarize, we know that winter runoff is increasing in winters in the Western Arctic, and it's likely that winter flow will also increase in small streams in continuous permafrost. Although winter water supply is increasing, it's really difficult to project general changes in the size and amount of off ice because the important thermal conditions that trigger them may be gradually becoming less common. Uh, we're learning more, however, about how some kinds of problematic off ice are generally initiated, and we need to work to ensure that these conditions, which we have a bit more control over, are avoided. So thank you very much for the introduction, Sean, and, and to everyone for the opportunity to present here. And uh, later on, I'd be pleased to answer questions and really appreciate the support of the, the organizations below and, uh, and the work of some of the authors who have done uh, uh, formative work in this field uh, shown here. Thank you. All right, thanks so much, Tim. I really appreciate your talk and hopefully we didn't wake the baby there. Um, we have a few more talks to go, and um, we're a little over time. There's nothing after us, so as I say, you know, don't sort of feel like you need, not till 3.30, um, so don't feel like you need to rush away or anything like that to catch something else. Um, the next speaker here joins us from the University of Waterloo to really kind of move down the aquatic continuum. Um, it's uh, Mehdi Muslami Adkam, and uh, in, he will speak on lake catchment interactions, brownification, and fish response. So we're bringing some, uh, some I guess I was going to say, you know, life, but I guess plants are alive, <laughs> Not non-plant life into the discussion. So uh, uh, Maddie, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Yay. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. My name is Mehdi Yan. I am a PhD student at the University of Waterloo. Uh, I am absolutely delighted to be part of this amazing and collaborative environment and have the opportunity to share with you some of my research interests. So thank you so much for having me today. I am going to talk about uh, lake interactions between lakes and catchments and how lake catchment interactions are changing and how fish populations in particular are responding to these changes. My research is part of a very large multi-year and collaborative project. So I would like to begin by extending my sincere gratitude to anybody who has contributed to this large project, including First Nation communities, funding sources and colleagues and my supervisor, Dr. Heidi Swanson. There is a lot to cover when it comes to lake catchment interactions. And today I will be focusing on organic matter, which is actually the primary fuel for the whole aquatic food webs. Organic matter is taken up by basal organisms, which are going to support primary production. Primary production is then support, then we're gonna support it productivity of the next uh, trophic level, primary consumers, and this will continue on and on through the food web up to apex animals such as top predatory fish. Uh, in aquatic ecosystems, organic matter are produced, are either produced internally or delivered from the catchment. And as, whereas internal organic matter are known to be uh, nutritious and easily consumed by consumers, terrestrially derived organic matter are of low quality and recalcitrant for consumers. Uh, and in the past couple of decades, the amount of terrestrially derived organic matter, which is usually measured as dissolved organic carbon or DOC, has increased substantially in lakes. And this is commonly known, referred to as brownification and has a number of uh, impacts consequences on lake ecosystems. And today I will try to provide a brief summary of some of the causes and consequences with some notes at the end why this is important. So we have talked a little bit about the causes of carbon and carbon cycle in the catchment and great introductions about all those materials. So thank you so much for the previous speakers. But if you ask me about the causes of brownification, well, my short answer is humans. And by that, I mean all the climate and development induced changes to climate warming and land cover composition. For example, this graph, which is from a study on sediment core on, on the lake system, showed that climate warming and permafrost thaws are increasing carbon input from catchment to downstream lakes. Another example is catchment land cover. And as you can see, uh, DOC concentrations in lakes depends on catchment land cover, such as forest type. And my last example is wildfire and precipitation. 
So we can see that here, POC uh, concentrations in lakes increase following wildfire in the catchment and also precipitation. So all the anthropogenic activities that are also responsible for environmental perturbations, such as uh, climate warming and land cover changes to the land cover or the reason behind increased POC input from uh, catchment to the downstream lakes. As I mentioned, there is a number of consequences on lake ecosystems and when it comes to fish populations, the reduced fish growth and production or biomass is what commonly is being observed. And this is usually related to light attenuation of the DOC. Uh, as its name suggests, brownification is darkening the water bodies and as a result, water clarity will decrease which will result in reduced primary production and reduced primary production will then uh, decrease productivity of the next trophic levels up to apex or top predatory fish. And, but this is not the only scenario. Uh, when water is darker, fish, especially those that rely on vision to feed and hunt will be less effective in their feeding attempts. And that means that they have to try more, which means more energy consumption. And again, uh, less energy being, being invested in growth. In addition, when water is darker, it will absorb the light, which means higher temperatures and higher temperature can uh, increase uh, fish metabolism. And that also means a slower growth rate. It is worth noting, however, that initial increases in the DO concentrations of terrestrially derived DOC might increase primary production in lakes. And this is usually attributed or related to uh, energy subsidizing and nutrients such as phosphorus and nitrogen being concurrently loaded to the lakes from catchment with DOC. And this has also been observed for uh, top predatory fish as well. So when studying or understanding such uh, environmental changes and interactions, it is important to have the wide ranges of environmental variables. And that brings us to my study area, the Dicho region in Northwest Territories. Well, aside from its gorgeousness and its amazing people, I call it the astonishing Dicho because it hosts a number of lakes that are environmentally different while being geographically neighbor. If you start looking at these lakes with data, we will see that lakes are located in catchments with, which uh, vary in their attributes such as elevation and slope and that uh, changes the results in different land cover composition. And uh, as a result of this different land cover composition, we have a wide ranges of environmental variables or water chemistry variables such as UC concentrations, primary production and water clarity. So this makes the digital an astonishing model environment to study and understand interactions between lakes and catchment and also or, uh, environmental changes. So long story short, data collected over seven years from Dicho showed that some lakes are influenced by catchment by their catchments more than the others. And as you can see on this PCA plot, we have catchment influence on the y on the x-axis. And as you can see that as the catchment influence increases, we have higher concentrations of DOC and all the ions that are known to be delivered from the catchment. So we have some lakes that are influenced by their catchment more than the others. And we also calculated growth rate in Northern Pike. As you can see on this plot, we have growth rate on the y-axis and catchment influence again on the x-axis. And as the catchment influence increases, we have the growth rate in Northern Pike uh, decreases significantly. So in lakes with high catchment influence, we have Northern Pike that are growing significantly slower. But what is interesting here is that unlike most studies that connect uh, reduced growth rate and production in fish to light attenuation of the DOC and reductions in productivity of the previous tropic levels, that is probably not the case in Dicho. Our food web analysis using stable isotopes suggests that Slower growth rate in Northern Pike in, catch, in lakes with high catchment influence is probably the result of uh, low nutritional value and less bioaccessibility of the terrestrially derived organic carbon compared to um, internal resources. Well, my time doesn't allow me to go more into details, but our results I think will be available in the coming weeks for the, pop, for the public. So in summary, we have 
a number of environmentally heterogeneous lakes that are that are influenced by their catchments to varying degrees, and so does the growth rate in Northern Pike. But why this is important? Well, we all know about the importance of subsistence fisheries for uh, the well-being of the Northerners and First Nation communities in these subarctic regions and around the, these subarctic lakes. And growth rate in fish uh, regulates important processes that are closely related to the both to both food security of these uh, subsistence fisheries and also food safety. I mean, the fish coming out from these subsistence fisheries. Fish growth rate regulates uh, reproduction, recruitment and mortality in fish populations. And it's thus at the core of fish population dynamics and sustainability of the fisheries. And understanding by understanding fish growth rate, we will be able to know uh, the optimum fishing pressure through which we can sustain, we can harvest this stock sustainably. And we can also predict how the fish populations will respond to our fishing pressure and also to environmental changes. Another important ecological process that is related to growth rate is mercury concentrations in muscle tissues in fish. And when, when fish grow faster, they usually accumulate less mercury for a given prey intake, and that this will eventually result in less mercury concentrations in muscle tissues. And this has been specifically documented for this species, northern pike. Uh, by the way, we are uh, making similar observations in the Decho in other part of my thesis. I am showing that in lakes, when in lakes where we have um, low catchment influence in which northern pike grow significantly faster. We have far less mercury concentrations in their muscle tissues. And this uh, has a lot of implications for human health and implementing mercury related consumption advisories in this uh, subarctic regions. So our results will help uh, our colleagues in human health department to make informed decisions. And I hope that by informed decisions coming out from such collaborations and communications, we can keep our ecosystems, wildlife and ourselves healthy. I hope that I'm not over time. Thank you so much. That is the end of my talk. All right, thanks so much, Mehdi. I wouldn't worry about being over time. I think we all are. So that's sort of the way these Zoom meetings are. I noticed you can't do anything once people start talking. So I appreciate your presentation. And again, you know, people can use the Q&A. I noticed our last speaker for the session um, didn't provide a title, although I know it's extremely um, uh, sort of busy time of year. Anthony Beyer joins us from Yukon. It's they've had lots of it's been like the NWT. It's been lots of snow, lots of high water, and Anthony's a hydrologist who works for the Yukon government. So he's been super busy at this time of year, doing his job, I suppose. So thanks, Anthony, for being, finding the time to join us and. Uh, I'm just going to cede you the floor and you can talk about whatever you want for 10 minutes or as long as it seems like you'd feel like talking like everyone else does. So uh, whenever you're ready, I'll let you get started. Thanks, Sean. And, and yeah, we are in the middle of our freshette. Um, our senior hydrologist is an old crow right now uh, monitoring the breakup there. This is the last major breakup uh, in the Yukon that we that uh, we forecast and follow. So yeah, it's exciting times. And uh, this is my first freshet season as a hydrologist with the Yukon government. So I've been working as a technologist for about four years. Um, so yeah, very quickly, I pulled together some sort of high level stuff from state of the environment reports. And I, I hope this is gonna be relatively quick and Thank you for inviting us to present and thanks to all the presenters for really great presentations. So um, some of this sort of larger scale stuff um, hopefully will be sort of a nice thing to think about as you link to the various presentations that we already saw today. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the trends that we are seeing in the hydrometric data here or trends that we think we're seeing some of the changes we expect to see moving forward in the future and how we're trying to better monitor so we can capture that. Um, so as Tim actually talked about in, in, uh, in his talk about icings, we are seeing that significant 
trend statistically significant in increases in minimum flows, uh, winter low flows. And that's almost across the board at all the Water Survey of Canada stations in the Yukon. Uh, we aren't really seeing any statistically significant trends in maximum discharge, um, and even we're seeing some decreasing trends at a few sites. And I'll, I'll leave you to speculate why that is. Um, zooming in on the extreme southeast corner, uh, the Liard River, you can see has that significant increase in minimum flows. Um, but mean and peaks aren't, uh, they don't have any statistically significant trend. If you look to the far north to the Porcupine, um, we see again that increase in the minimum flows, but also maybe more of a trend in annual discharge and um, peak flow as well. So that's interesting. And that may have something to do with the effects of climate change being more significant the further north that we go. Um, anomalies also seem to be more frequent now. Uh, I've just have a few graphs here to show that in sort of the past 10 to 15 years, we're seeing a lot of the, the floods of record. So you can see the 2012 peak discharge uh, on the Liard, upper Liard was the flood of record. Uh, for the Klondike, it was in 2013. Um, for Marsh Lake, it was the 2007 flood, which not only was well above anything that had been previously recorded, but it also lasted a really long time. So that was a really unique flood event. Um, and although this doesn't really fit here, I didn't have a better place to put it, but just a note that Kluani Lake had its uh, historic low water level in 2016 after the shift in the outflow from the Casca Walsh Glacier. So previously the flow kind of split into two drainages. Uh, one was the Slims River draining to Kluani Lake, the other is the Elsec River, and it shifted and now all of that meltwater is going into the Elsec River. So the Alsec River is, uh, in contrast, getting, you know, it, its average annual discharge has increased to record levels. Um, anomalies in the snowpack. These two maps from our snow bulletin illustrate really well the sort of uh, up and downs that we're seeing. In 2019, our peak snowpack was less than half of normal across most of the Southern Territory. And Two years later this year, it was uh, at least 150% across the Southern Territory with record snowpack in the Southern Lakes region around Whitehorse. So almost 200% of normal there, that was record setting. Uh, and the only reason records weren't broken in some of the other areas was because they were broken last year uh, in 2020. So we're seeing these anomalies more and more. Uh, we installed a snow scale in the upper Liard Basin uh, two years ago. It's a 300 millimeter maximum snow scale. We've never measured 300 millimeters at that site before. And both of the last two winters, we maxed out that snow scale, unfortunately. So now we have to go switch it out for a bigger one. Uh, that's meant some great skiing down in Southern Yukon and lots of avalanches and road closures. Uh, and this, this one particular snow course, Log Cabin, it's actually a British Columbia snow course, but we sample it here in the Yukon and submit the data to them. It's the one snow course that shows a significant trend of increasing snowpack. And you can see that record snowpack in 2021 on the far right side. Um, you can also see that it appears that there's more variability in the previous couple of decades uh, than there was previously. And that record goes all the way back to 1960. It's one of the longest running snow courses we have. Uh, another change that we're seeing is with freeze up and break up. Um, in Dawson City, for example, it seems less predictable. 
there were two years in a row, 2017, 18, and 18, 19, where there was no official ice bridge uh, as, as deemed by the Department of Highways and Public Works in Dawson. Uh, people still found ways to get across the river, of course, but uh, there wasn't a government approved ice bridge. And that is really unusual. We also saw an extremely high water level freeze up in 2020. And we are seeing a trend towards earlier breakups and less predictable breakups. Some of the old models that we have to try and estimate when breakup occurs don't work so well anymore. And uh, that seems to be just a result of uh, more variable weather. Um, so as has been mentioned multiple times, we are expecting temperatures to increase more significantly in the north, twice the global average. Uh, you can see there that uh, between 84 and 2012, uh, the significant increase in Yukon and Northwest Territories. Um, and that trend seems to be more significant in winter, which links back to that significant trend in winter base flows perhaps. Uh, precipitation is also expected to increase and more so in the winter again. And you can see more so in the far north. And, you know, maybe that has something to do with why we're seeing more of an obvious trend on the Porcupine River than, say, the Liar down in the southeast. Uh, we're expecting permafrost to continue melting and glaciers to continue receding as well, of course. And those will have implications for regional hydrology. Uh, so Yukon is data sparse. Um, there's pretty low confidence in the weather and climate models for the territory because there's not a lot of data to drive them. Uh, it makes it difficult to uh, forecast flow. Uh, there's a small population of people here and they're mostly concentrated in the South and Whitehorse, but we have communities all over and they're mostly on water bodies and they're all connected by a large networks of roads, um, which is pretty unique to the north and the Yukon. And you know those roads have lots of washouts, slumping, heaving, icings, as Tim referred to. You know, in 2012, we had uh, big washouts on the Alaska Highway, which cut us off from supply line for several days. And we've already had a washout in 2020 on the Robert Campbell Highway that cut off the community of Ross River from uh, its main route to Whitehorse. Oh, just a few photos there. I forgot to click through while I went through those points. So what are we doing at Water Resources? Um, well, we're converting our small stream network to real time, finally. Uh, and you can see one of those stations on the left. And we're continuing to upgrade our automated uh, snow monitoring sites. So you can see we've started using snow scales uh, as opposed to snow pillows at some of our sites. You can see one on the right and we're adding new stand pipes and generally overhauling the existing stations and looking to add a few more. Uh, we plan to add cameras and maybe some other peripherals to the Water Survey of Canada stations to give us better uh, view of what's happening, especially when those gauges have problems, particularly during the freshet period. And we're developing better tools like uh, using a flood early warning system, developing tools in R. Uh, you can see a mesh model there graciously supplied by University of Saskatchewan to help with our flood forecasting program. And we're trying to streamline some of our in-house processes by using things like electronic field forms. So our techs have more time to devote to higher level um, data processing than entry and that kind of thing. Uh, and we already use Aquarius time series here, uh, have been for a few years. Uh, we've doubled our flood forecasting team in 2020 from one to two. And hopefully we can continue that. Um, we're working more closely with community members on the ground during flood season uh, to get those crucial uh, local knowledge and, and photographs. And water resources is continuing to build a groundwater team and our, our water quality monitoring program. And of course, we're always gonna continue to support and contribute to work in the Wolf Creek Basin. And you can see uh, a certain 
and someone you might know on the right there conducting important research on Wolf Creek. So thanks so much for inviting us today and thanks so much for all the great presentations. And uh, yeah, I, I hope you have a great rest of the conference. Thanks. Thanks so much, Anthony. And it's a, all that snow south of Whitehorse does sound like some pretty good skiing, that's for sure. It's amazing uh, to see all the work and thanks for sharing the, the, what Water Resources has been doing and some of the priorities. And I'd also like to thank all the speakers who came out. What a, what a session, we were about 100 attendees at the maximum and who stayed throughout. And I'm sorry we're a little longer, we're 15 minutes over. There was only a, uh, a couple questions in the chat. I don't know how these chats actually work. I guess it's supposed to type it in, but if no one wants to chat, I mean, I think um, hopefully everyone can find the, the uh, you know, the, the, the presenters online, if they have questions, I'm sure they would be happy to uh, to answer questions anytime. But personally, I'd like to thank, I'm sure Jen would like to thank too. I don't know if Jen wants to come on and say a few words. I've never hosted one of these sessions before, so I'm not really sure what to do. Probably have a beer or something like that, but it's, uh, I think that's at five. So uh, Jen, do you have any, <laughs> any thoughts? <laughs> No, I just, I, I, I really appreciated all the wonderful talks today and yeah, really excited. We had such a great turnout um, and, and thank you all for joining us. Yeah, and I hopefully see you in the North soon. It's, uh, it's amazing that we had such, uh, yeah, such a high turnout. It was really, really good. And notice there's talks through the rest of the week. So look at the program, it's open, advertise it. And I think this will be online within 24 hours or something like that. So if you would like to review them again, uh, they'll be there for your public viewing. So I think, is there more, one question, is, is there more work on linking vegetation hedge patterns with permafrost presence, absence, and hydrology? I'm not going to answer, I'd say yes. I, I, I think- uh, Does one of our panelists want, does, does, does one of our speakers or, want to touch on that? If she's still here or? Oh, okay. I'm still here, just trying to find the question there, got it. Um, I can uh, chat a little bit about this. Uh, I'm working on a review paper at the moment, thinking broadly about vegetation trajectories in different permafrost landforms. And it's something we really want to incorporate into the high latitude drone ecology network work. If there's anyone here who has drone data that hasn't already contributed to that network, please do get in touch. So we're working on the first paper out of that collaboration, but then there'll be subsequent papers. But I do think it's sort of an area that my perception is at least of the, the vegetation plant ecologist types that we haven't fully dealt with um, the thinking in terms of where we would expect sort of hotspots of change within the Arctic and how that relates to um, what's going on in the subsurface and, and these direct versus indirect drivers. And so that those links between permafrost hydrology and vegetation change, I feel like we've sort of stayed within our disciplines a bit and, and the really cool interface is that the, point at which those groups come together, which your guys's collaboration is sort of primed to um, cross those thresholds in terms of better understanding. Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks. Oh. Tim wants to answer a question. Tim, you can answer a question. I'm not sure what the question is. Sure, thanks. Thanks. For <laughs> the, um, there was a question that um, came I think it was um, shortly after the talk I gave um, from Cameron Hogarth, and the question was, does the Norilsk fuel spill, which was in, in Russia, have lessons for Canada about the potential impact of permafrost loss on northern infrastructure? And I think it's a, a great question, and I think it ties in with talks that a number of us have given. But um, uh, as Steve and others have, have kind of outlined, permafrost uh, is is like a glue that holds the landscape together and it provides a foundation for for all of our northern infrastructure and um, apart from being a foundation it also uh, in a number of ways provides containment for 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 uh, processes and, and products that uh, that that we don't want to escape into the environment such as drilling mud sumps uh, in the Beaufort Delta region which were um, created in the 70s and 80s primarily to contain fluids from drilling activities and it was assumed that those would hold those products in perpetuity and uh, one of the challenges facing the all of all of us particularly the communities of the Delta is the the containment of these materials and permafrost that is is changing and, and in some cases degrading so um Cameron, uh, I'll follow up with you uh, more in specifically, but uh, but yeah, infrastructure is um, is totally reliant on on stable permafrost, and uh, it's it's uh, an, an immense uh, challenge for for northerners and the global um, 
the circumpolar north. Oh, thanks, Tim. All right. I don't know how to end this session, but I'd like, again like just to thank all the speakers again. I think Aaron typed in an answer as probably if there's nothing to add. You can jump on if not. But um, oh, Jen. Oh, you're talking to your kids. No, yeah. I was Zoom talking meeting. to a kid. Yeah, Zoom meeting. Kid. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So so I think I'll I'll leave it here. I don't think I have the control to end the meeting, but I will just turn my computer off. And, uh, and then it'll be over for me. So uh, thanks again. I really appreciate all of our speakers for taking the time and doing a Zoom. So I'll do the clap or my emoji thing. And, uh, and hopefully I can see you all soon in, uh, in person. So thanks everyone. And I'll give you a wave and I'll hit the leave and I'll imagine this uh, is over. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>